pack your backpacks, break out the map, and let's get lost in the scenery. It's time for Architecture, Coffee, and Ink. Hello, this is Hollywood C, and you're listening to Architecture, Coffee, and Ink, a podcast dedicated to introducing concepts, detailing out designs, and tackling the architecture you might not realize the meaning behind. I'm your hostess, and I'm here today to start introducing you to the designs that make you wonder why. So I ask you to brew your coffee, grab your sketchbook and pen, and let's begin. Hello everyone and happy day. I hope that everyone has had a wonderful week and I hope that everyone is being productive, crossing off your spring cleaning list and rocketing through the long to-do lists that seem to multiply in corners when you aren't looking. But as I said before, this week we are going to be stepping into cultural landscape as I recover from my midterm weeks, plural, because somehow in addition to my to-do list multiplying, it seems like my midterms decided to follow the same vein. I'm about 90% sure I took a couple of midterms for classes I have never been a part of, or at least it feels like it. I am really excited to have this moment to take a break and dive into another topic. So thank you all, my dear listeners, for being with me. This episode has managed to turn itself into an extremely massive episode. So that is why it took me just a bit more time enough time that it has actually been broken up into two parts. So, because I have spent so much time with either historic sites or architecture, I thought a nice side venture into the landscape was needed this week. We cannot forget our landscape and our, and our interior architects and designers, and I have been remiss in neglecting them. So this week is gonna be focused on cultural landscapes, and in doing so, we are going to be diving into the topic a little bit more than we did in our brief intro on Killing Stones and Sulphur Spring. Later on in this week, on Friday at 5 a.m., I will release the start of a bonus religious architecture episodes, which will probably only be coming out every few weeks in addition to our regular episodes. We'll be kicking off with an episode called Hanging Cemeteries and Cities of the Dead. And we'll be focusing on easing into the topic with a wide introduction to the various ways that the dead were honored and incorporated into architecture. After that, we will hit the big 12 plus religions and discuss in an important building and or landscape that is important or influenced by the design or represented through the design. I am trying to line up a few more interviews, but right now with thesis, graduating, working, finding a new job and relocating, it's been a bit of a struggle to find the time to conduct extra interviews on top of my hectic schedule. But with the next big presentation for me being seven weeks away, I should have time to start conducting them again and bringing more guest speakers back into the show. But once again, before we begin, please remember to always check your sources check your facts, and more importantly, check me. I should never be your primary information source. So I'm gonna take a moment and completely recap and expand on the introduction from the previous episode on just what cultural landscapes are, because I realized that repeating the phrase multiple times fails to actually explain what it is I'm talking about. And while my nickel and dime level introduction Sorry, I just realized what an incredibly specific idiom that was. My incredibly short and sweet introduction from the previous episode was a good starting point to understanding the topic. It fails to fully encompass everything that it could be. So this topic has one overarching definition and then is further broken down into four types. So in this episode, we are first going to be breaking down the definition, then each type, and discussing an example of each. So instead of one large case study, we'll be focusing and discussing four case studies, which is really why this episode ended up being broken into two. But doing it this way will allow us to compare the differences and will hopefully make the overall topic a little bit clearer. 
In some cases, I may actually volley between his, both historical and modern examples when possible, because I do want to make sure that everyone understands that we are actually still continuing to actively work in this field. So last time I spoke about this topic, I started by reading the following paragraph and gosh, is it weird to read my own quotes. So quote, um, first let's define a cultural landscape. So overall, a cultural landscape is a concept that originated more from the like, geography, anthropology and ecology side of life. But as the field of landscape architecture has been evolving, we have begun to really embrace and understand the importance of this. But basically, it's a landscape that has some form of cultural value. This can be due to religious significance, historical value, or a significant person may have had an association with the site. What is essentially key to this concept is that it has value either to the residents or the individual in proximity to the location. And that's really where people struggle with the concept. Because in everyday conversation, when people say value, they're referring to the economic value, capital, money, or decreasing slash increasing property values. But here, think of value as having weight, importance, significance. While it can also have economic value, that's not the driving force behind the importance of the landscape. A good portion of the time, this landscape will include natural resources and animals, and this can be either wild or domestic animals. But for today, understand that each landscape and location fits because it has historical, religious, cultural, and even emotional value. One role that landscape architects and architects take is as stewards of the scape. That is not the only way we have interacted with the sites, but it is an incredibly common role. Another way those in the profession interact is through design, working either to save, encompass, incorporate, or celebrate the landscape. There really is a variety of ways that it has been accomplished throughout history. And multiple firms have been rock stars across the globe to really bring the importance of this topic to the forefront of conversations. There have there are multiple papers about this topic and it has been covered in both classes and snuck into tourist traps, which admittedly is important to me that it has and continues to become an important part of the everyday narrative. I have no doubt all of my listeners have figured out that I am a bit of a hippie and highly value embracing, celebrating and respecting cultures and differences. So I really appreciate that this topic brings landscape, firms, and opportunities into the forefront of conversation that traditionally haven't been in the spotlight. While I still appreciate a classic case study as well, you've probably guessed from my topic list that I also like to appreciate and discuss topics that aren't exactly mainstream. And wow, that sounded a lot like I'm trying too hard to be hipster there for a moment. Before we break down two of the four topics or types of cultural landscapes down further, I think that one thing my definition missed was that a cultural landscape can also be representative of an aesthetic value as well, which is something that I think that in the larger context of case studies, we forget. We tend to get caught up in things like understanding meanings and how funeral rites affect the layout or historical relevance of the person and fail to remember that while that is important, aesthetic values and emphasis can be equally important important when reading and interpreting landscapes. I'm not saying that it needs to fall exclusively in a single category. In fact, to this end, the point I'm trying to make is that it can and should be considered through multiple angles and lenses. This is a topic where once you've reached a conclusion, go back and find another one. Be I believe all architecture and landscapes should be revisited and studied multiple times because it hits or impacts you differently depending on where in your architectural journey you are. This goes doubly true for the concepts we're going to be discussing today. Moving on, there is also a cultural landscape foundation 
And to wrap up the general introduction, I'm going to read the following quote that I saw essentially copied and pasted from their website onto almost every single source I visited. It was extremely amusing to find the same paragraph over and over. And it feels like if I don't quote it to you, I will be doing all of my listeners a huge disservice. The excerpt reads as follows, quote, cultural landscapes are landscapes that have been affected, influenced, or shaped by human involvement. A cultural landscape can be associated with a person or event. It can be thousands of acres or a tiny homestead. It can be a grand estate, industrial park, park, garden, cemetery, campus, and more. Collectively, cultural landscapes are works of art, narratives of culture, and expressions of regional identity, end quote. And again, that is a direct passage from the Cultural Landscape Foundation. And as always, I will be listing the sources on the blog. So if you wish to read more on the principles and the values of the organization itself, visit their website. I will post an announcement on Facebook once I have the blog updated this week. Also, on both their website as well as on others, it lists the four different types of landscapes. Vernacular, ethnographic, historic, and designed. So on either the foundation website or within the other sources, it will list a series of landscapes and projects that can be included within all of the categories. However, since this podcast is not the type to just accept a single source as gospel, all of my case studies I will be discussing w- will have multiple websites listed for them. And here's where we're going to switch the format of the show. I will tackle each of the definitions and briefly describe a case study and explain how that fits into the definition. Please remember that while I am using a single case study per location, each example can oftentimes be counted underneath multiple categories, and that doesn't have to stay underneath a single label. But first up, we're going to be discussing the vernacular landscape. So a vernacular landscape is one that has resulted or been shaped by the individuals and communities who occupy it. This can be through either the occupations, the land usages, whether that is farming, livestock, moving and damming a river, design, etc. It can also be for or in the result of daily or significant life. And what I mean by that is it can be both created through the daily needs of the, of the community slash people or through the needs of specific and highly specified need. This one really kind of seems like a catch-all for me as a term. If I had to pick two words to define it, it would be human intervention. And from that, I would have to ask the following questions. Does it have it? Was it formed by it? And was it shaped by it? And so on from there. So the example I enjoyed the most was the James River Park System. The James River Park System is located in Richmond, Virginia, in the United States, and currently totals over 600 acres, or roughly 2.5 square kilometers. Along the James River, which for those who have studied colonialism extensively, you are probably very familiar with it, as it attaches to the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic Ocean, and was the home of Jamestown, which was the start of the English colonies in what is now modern day America. So this park is actually much further inland from that and was occupied prior to the English colonization by various tribes, probably as early as 15,000 years ago. The park itself is actually a relatively new project. As the land was donated in 1972, after two gentlemen named Charles J. Schaffner and John W. Keith acquired multiple islands and lands along the river throughout the 60s. One thing I noticed when researching was that several of the signs marking the dedication and donation said that they collected and donated as it was acquired before the James River system was created, while the websites seemed to indicate that the land was accumulated 
and then donated together at once. I imagine that this discrepancy is due to the legalities and also how the river is slash was slowly being incorporated into a continuous system. So as the swatches of land are being included into the park, they're incorporated into the master plan, which is available online. The plan does include a series of recreation and parks, public works, and public utilities, as well as preserving and highlighting several historical buildings and sites. The master plan also covers the goals and objectives and maintenance, etc. One brief note that I will say is that if you've never looked at a master plan, I would really encourage you to search them out, um, even if it's just for a park in your area. Sometimes they're very dense and text heavy, but some, like in the case of this, are a lot more geared towards public knowledge. Um, so you don't need the degree to read through a master plan. Uh, normally, it helps if you want to understand how your park is being planned for in the future. So if it is part of your local community, you can kind of see where they're planning on going, plus maintenance goals, understanding visit, a vision statements, and things like that. So if you're not in the field, it is a good starting point um, to kind of start learning about the topics and learning about your local resources available. The names and companies associated with the current master plan are VHB Hargraves Associates, Richmond, Virginia, the city of, and Friends of the James River Park. But the reason that this park is considered to be part of the vernacular is that in addition to the creation and formation of trails and the upkeep of the historical sites, efforts are also being undertaken to design and combat habitat degradation. Yes, part of the parks are designed to be natural, but overall this landscape is designed and shaped Altogether, there are some 14 total pieces or parks together and was first designed underneath Dana Javina and Kongen Associates. One thing that this scape does really well is capitalize on the history and the industry. The industry also shaped the landscape quite literally, but this scape also brings us to the next topic of a designed landscape, because as I mentioned, this was a heavily designed project. While the history people and the industry helped to shape the landscape, there is still a conscious design effort being made as well. Design landscapes are basically, as I previously stated, designed. I think that the two words here would be control and deliberate. These are projects and landscapes that have a lot of effort and conscious decisions being made that's not to say that vernacular is not also through the deliberate ministrations of human effort. It's more that these are the type of projects like the gardens of Versailles or estate gardens or city gardens, etc. There's often an element of style here, whereas the previous topic focused more so on the actions. Previously, the deliberate action would be the creation of a dam, where the vernacular landscape is the reservoir and the dam where the reservoir would not exist without the creation of the dam. And the dam may have been built for electricity and for water or in natural resource accumulation. This doesn't make the scape any less designed or important, but the intentions behind the creation of the scape help to define which category it belongs to, as well as the method it was achieved. To kind of further explain this point, it's the needs of the people and the community. So for the design landscape, the probably most well-known example is of course the Versailles Gardens. And this is a good topic to do a quick intro on because I already know someone is going to email and request a more in-depth episode. And it's honestly like a rite of passage on an architecture podcast that you have to dedicate at least one episode about Versailles. The Gardens of Versailles was commissioned by King Louis the 14th, the Sun King or Louis the Great of France and Navarre, who had the longest sovereign reign. He utilized and weaponized architecture and opulence. Both the building and the gardens we are focusing on today are a brilliant expression of politics, or rather a method of expressing and conducting politics. A seat 
and implementation of control. It was also a way of expressing his absolute control over the environment. Andre Lenotre was tasked to handle the design in 1661 and worked with Jean-Baptiste Colbert and Charles Lebrun. A little bit more about each of these men, King Louis XIV's reign was referred to as the Great Century, and he focused on the ideas of absolutism. This means that he believed that he, re he ruled by divine right, and as such could only be so judged. He was the OG Slytherin in my opinion, because his moves and motivations were focused on power, expressing, gaining, controlling. He also focused on incorporating symbolism to Apollo, the Greek god of the sun and the sun in general. He did focus on arts, reorganization, etc. Andre the Nôtre was originally employed underneath the king's uncle and came from a family of gardeners. He became a head gardener on the heels of his father, but achieved notoriety under his designs at Volley Volcan. When I was first introduced to this topic, my professor told me that Versailles was supposed to be the step above or better than what he produced at Valle Vaucon, a political maneuver in which the king was making sure that he would always be the one measured against. And regardless of what estate you compared to Versailles would always be found lacking. There is the expression where we say you were trying where you are, quote, trying to keep up with the Joneses, end quote, which is basically where you are essentially trying to make sure that you're always able to achieve or maintain the same level of those around you. So King Louis XIV was trying to make sure that he was always going to be the Joneses or the standard. And I think we can say that he succeeded given how much of the standard this is of French gardens especially given how much of a universally known concept this is in the field. The gardens themselves are a series of highly designed grounds with an extensive series of fountains, parterres, paths, walks, sculptures, the orangery, and groves. When you look at plans of the site or even visitor maps, the first thing you notice is the use of the axle arrangements. There are clearly defined pathways and designed and controlled gardens, grids, and even smaller radials. And this brilliant use of these concepts together really elevate the plan enough for it to succeed. Another aspect of its success is that there is a bit of a management implemented into the design. The plants are replaced roughly every 100 years or so, but the accompaniment of carefully controlled greenery and backdrop crafted a very carefully cultivated experience. This is what makes the best example of a designed landscape because every moment is considered and uses control and deliberate decisions. Between the two topics, one comment I have noticed from students is that between designed and vernacular landscapes, they will often feel like vernacular landscapes aren't worth as much or is not important to highlight and understand within the profession most oftentimes due to a discounting of the intentions or the perceived effort. To fully appreciate this topic, I encourage everyone to not compare. And I know that this is oftentimes a knee-jerk reaction. So next week, in addition to finishing up with the last two topics, we are going to interpret this topic, break down how this impacts other disciplines, fields of research, and how we can start to use this in our own practices. But unfortunately, that is all we have time for this week. But once again, a big thank you to all of my listeners. Please, please, please rate and review. If you liked it, loved it, hated it, let me know. I love feedback. Um, everything will be linked in the show notes. I am slowly, slowly updating the blog. It's behind. You can totally shame me. I am behind on all of my social medias and I am working steadily on revamping things again, bringing in the websites to the 21st century, kicking and screaming. I have exciting blender animations I am trying to launch in the next few weeks, but I won't promise anything until I finish them. We do have the Facebook page and group, everything underneath the name Architecture Coffee and Ding. And blog website is architectureinc.design.blog. And everything is linked in the show notes. But that is quite enough out of me. So 
As always, may your coffee mugs be full and your inkwells never run dry.